Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's EEA Education Series webinar. Today we will discuss the emergence of open banking in Web 3.0. Today's call has been recorded and will be available to all attendees soon after today's presentation. The Enterprise Ethereum Alliance enables organizations to adopt and use Ethereum technology in their daily business operations. The EEA empowers the Ethereum ecosystem to develop new business opportunities, drive industry adoption, and learn and collaborate with one another. We welcome any and everyone to join and become a part of our global community. At this time, we are pleased to introduce our moderators, the Open Banking Lead of API3, Robert Rico, and the Head of Latin America and Blockchain Initiatives at the Open Bank Project, Francis Francisco Montenegro. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure for us to be here and bring you this session in our partnership with API3 and the Open Bank Project. And just talk a little bit more about the emergence of open banking in the Web3 and what this innovation really represents. So to begin with, we have an agenda. Uh, Robert, can you go on to the next slide? Where first we will spend the first 20 minutes uh, just introducing a little bit about team members and the companies. And then we will uh, briefly touch on what if what is open banking and what this means for the Web 3.0. Following that, um, the API 3 team will explain the API connectivity problem with the Air Node as the solution and the gateway for bringing open banking data into the Web 3.0. And then we will talk a little bit about our 10-year development partnership to meet this objective in conjunction with the Open Bank Project and API 3. After we've touched on these uh, introductory topics, we will have a panel discussion between OBP, the Open Bank Project, API3, and DAI. After that, we will have a Q&A. So I encourage all the listeners to please uh, post questions in the chat as we go, and we will be addressing them at the end of the panel. So uh, the Open Bank Project, we have Simon Redfern. He's the founder of the Open Bank Project, CEO of Tesobe, and he's an open banking pioneer of the UK open banking movement. Uh, my name is uh, Francisco Montenegro. I'm leading the blockchain strategy at the Open Bank Project. And on behalf of the API3 team, we have Heiki Vantinen. He's the co-founder of API3. We have Robert Rico is the open banking lead and legal. And then from DAI, uh, we have Raul Navas Salazar. He is the FinTech director of DAI. And he has previous work with the Mexican regulators. So in this uh, discussion, we will also be uh, hearing the perspective of the regulators uh, in terms of what we're doing with open banking and the Web3. So onto the next slide, Robert, please. To give a little introduction on our company uh, technology, it's the Open Bank project that was created by Tesobe. Uh, Tesobe innovated um, with pioneering the UK open banking standards. And since 2010, they built the Open Bank project, which has become the leading open, open source, open banking solution in the space with more than 400 APIs that cover multiple regulatory standards around the world and that has reached a vibrant community of 11,000 developers that are using the standards to build mobile apps and it also has done work consulting regulators around the world um, with their standards with the Berlin Group, Australian CDR um, and the latest one being Mexico Open Finance. On to the next slide Robert. So just to get everyone here on the same page of what is open banking and open banking started as a movement to democratize financial data uh, to the customer because the customer should have access to their financial data when and where they want it. And this is all done via API. And since the inception of this, it has become a, um, the, the foundation for many fintechs to flourish at the uh, expense of the bank. So uh, we view open banking as the perfect gateway or the rails 
to embed or connect DeFi solutions onto the traditional banking industry or to make available traditional financial products or traditional um, open banking use cases onto the decentralized web. Also in partnership with the bank, right, Francisco, you said expense stuff, so not just expense, but in right, partnership. In partnership. With, yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Next slide, please, Robert. So um, Open Bank Project, in the last 11 years, we have worked with more than uh, 60 financial customers. And like mentioned before, there's around 11,000 developers that are using OBP standards just to uh, try to build better apps. And we have worked with regulators and we have 20 partners around the globe where uh, our latest partner is API3, and this one comes completely in the light of innovation and trying to innovate this space as we are first movers in making open banking data available to the Web 3.0. Next slide, please, Robert. So what does the open banking or open finance data for the Web 3.0 mean? Well, uh, just to explain here a little bit, open finance, it's an extension of open banking where it makes um, accessible other products that are not agnostic to the banking industry that can be incorporated into the banks uh, via APIs. So what does open banking APIs enable? Uh, in the most basic uh, form, it's read account information where you can have in a third party app and you can have access to your bank account. You can view your how much money you have from different bank accounts into one app. And the other use case is payment initiation where you can actually start a payment from your bank account on a third party app. The other common use case is banking as a service where a bank can deploy one of their financial products onto a third party app and uh, reach a broader network that they normally couldn't. And on the banking as a platform side is a way for banks to integrate third party services that are not developed from the bank into their digital interface or their digital offering. And some other use cases are account aggregation where banks can uh, aggregate several accounts from their clients and they can create, have better analytics to provide better credit scoring uh, and have a better view on, on their customers and provide them, provide them better products. So with open finance, it incorporates other components where it's insurance, uh, stocks and pensions, for example, that are not traditional just to the banking industry. And we want to translate all of these use cases into the decentralized web. We think that this is the perfect gateway uh, to bridge these two, two worlds because what, why a user in his DeFi app shouldn't be able to read their bank account balance or start a payment from their bank account balance or also enhance some uh, traditional banking offerings uh, via uh, banking as a platform and incorporate some decentralized finance offerings into the banking uh, digital interfaces. So this is um, our view on this, and this is how we're gonna do it. Uh, I'll explain on the next slide, please, Robert. So uh, in, in our technology, uh, the core banking uh, feeds open finance data to the API la layer, which is provided by the open bank project. And all these APIs enable different use cases for accounts, payments, KYC, branches, products, and more. So now uh, these are not natively connected with the Web 3.0, but we're solving that with the partnership with API 3. By connecting our Open Bank project APIs with the Air Node, we can make a Web 3 connections where we expect to see many uh, use cases uh, arrive and many services to be innovated. And some of this will be discussed uh, in the panel. So now I'll, I will pass it on to Robert to talk a little bit more on API 3 and to discuss a bit on the API connectivity problem. 
Thank you, Francisco, and thank you for the great overview. Uh, thank you for EEA, the folks at EEA for having us here and, and allowing us to share what, what we're uh, working on. So a little bit about API 3. We've been in this space since 2018 through API 3's predecessor and working connecting APIs to the Web 3.0. We connected various amounts of APIs, many APIs and various amounts of different variations of APIs to, to or, an, an Oracle infrastructure. And in our experience there, we found critical limitations to really onboard, if, to efficiently onboard data into the blockchain on chain. And so these limitations really drove us to innovate and to think about this problem of how to deliver data efficiently onto the chain. And so it really dro drove us to innovate. And so the first thing that API did, API 3 did is, is first of all, API 3 is DAO governed, meaning that there is no centralized party, rather it's the entire community steering the ship. And our developers have been just phenomenal. We are now compatible with EVM, with the various EVM chains, Ethereum, Polygon, Phantom, Harmony, Plasm, Tomo Chain Complex, to name a few. And also we are backed by some of the most respectable folks in the VC space in, in, our, in cryptocurrencies. Uh, Digital Currency Group, Placeholder, Pantera, CoinFund, Accomplished, and Hashed. And our newest power partner, is open bank project here. We're, as Francisco just stated, we entered into a 10 year partnership to bridge open banking data to the web 3.0. And so a little bit about API 3 and what our mission is. Really, our mission is really to make APIs fully compatible to web 3.0. And so you may be asking, well, why APIs and why are, they so, why are they so important? So APIs are the glue to the internet. They are what make it, the internet as we know today run and so, for example, corporations such as Self, Sports, eBay, Facebook, Google, all these different corporations our society really relies on to provide these services are powered by APIs. And so if Web 3.0 wants to interact with the real world, we need to make APIs as synced as possible with, with, the, web, with, the, web, with the Web 3.0. So, so making these APIs connected. And the reason is because if we're able to connect APIs directly to Web 3.0, it's going to create new dApps. We're going to be seeing new smart digital agreements, smart contract-based digital agreements. And it's going to expand, in our, in our point of view, it's going to expand the markets for these decentralized networks. More endpoints, more API, more dApps, more agreements, more transactions. And so how do we get there? And what we solve for API 3 is the API connectivity problem. And what that means is that, well, looking at blockchains is the way that blockchains achieve consensus, they cannot natively connect to external data. They cannot natively connect to APIs. And so what we've seen develop over the years is that current connection solutions really are depending on middlemen. And what this has seen is that API providers require these expert management people and teams to come on board and connect with Web 3.0. So it's essentially asking these, these API providers to onboard an entire different team, an entire different structure within their companies. And what we've seen, it's just not scalable. And what we've seen over the years is that many API providers, and remember API providers are companies at the end of the day, they're hiring third-party companies that deliver and resell the data for them to the Web 3.0. And this really, in our opinion, opens up a big can of worms because API providers are risking GDPR breaches, spillage, and unauthorized data resale. And on the topic of GDPR breaches, I think this is, or we think this is one of the most important topics to address because as it, as it, as it goes into, G, into a GDPR breach, if, for example, an API provider is, breaches a GDPR and they're, they're plugged out, AP, it doesn't only impact API providers, it's going to impact the dApps and blockchains that they run on. So it's very important to, to make sure that, G, that API providers have this ability to be GDP, GDPR compliant. And so here we have an illustration that is showing API providers can't connect to dApps. And so from our experiences, previous solutions really focus as how do blockchains as a technology connect web APIs? And API 3's focus is really ask the question, well, how does APIs as a technology connect to blockchains? And as a, as a reminder, data sharing happens through APIs. The main, are, the main solutions that we rely on rely, are powered by APIs. And the key point here is really that all APIs, they have adapters, they have standards to share such data. However, up to this day, there's no uniform standard API adapter that exists 
for APIs to connect Web 2.0 data to Web 3.0, to the Web 3.0. And so this is where we're proudly at API 3 are excited to share, to share with you the Air Node. From our opinion, this is a breakthrough in our space. Air Node is a simple to use open source API gateway that allows API providers to directly and easily connect to Web 3.0 without any active management or use of a third parties directly from the API. And what this looks like, it's a quick setup in minutes. It's a set and forget function. API providers point their API, run the script, point their API to an error node and they're connected. It's a plug and play, very easy. And it's also very, it's also free for API providers to deploy. And the beauty of this is this allows API providers to retain full control of their data. And this allows them to be GDPR compliant when transacting in the web 3.0, in, in the web 3.0. And this is very important because now we're, we're building here is an end-to-end -end compliance solutions from the, from the data provider side all the way to the DAS. We are building these foundational pieces that allows these applications to be fully GDPR compliant and fully, reg fully able to be regulated within the confines of the law. And so one of the our excited partners here today is the Open Bank Project. We'll be providing over 400 open banking APIs to the Web 3.0. And so what this looks like is, is drawn here in this diagram. The Open Bank Project will be running an error node and these error nodes will be connected now directly to blockchain platforms. And from there, this is gonna be a, a circle, it's almost a circle economy where we're really after here is a partnership for an end-to-end -end open source financial environments and financial technology and solutions, which has never been before seen to, to explore an entire system from traditional finance to decentralized finance, all housed under open source code, which is really just an amazing breakthrough in, 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 in working in this. And so the way we're gonna achieve this is Open Bank Project has over 11 years and experience with working 60 international institutional banks and six regulators. So we're gonna be conducting in the first year of our partnership four tech sprints, these mini hackathons, where financial regulators, financial institutions, and the communities, the blockchain communities and fintech communities are invited to join and participate in this entire realm of, 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 of these different parties are invited to join and see what type of new, of new financial realities can look like at large. And so for that, that ends our presentation here today of our solutions, and we will jump into a panel discussion. And to start off with, uh, the first question will go to Simon. And one of the questions that's, that's very often asked is Simon, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Simon, you know, open banking is, is, is revolutionary in itself. It's, it's radical in itself. And so now, for open banking to connect to blockchains, that's can that can that is also very radical in itself. What are the bank's uh, sentiment in connecting open banking with blockchain, with blockchain-based applications? Hey, well, yeah, thanks for the question, and uh, hello everyone uh, from Berlin. Um, yeah, so I, I think that you know the banks are interested um, for sure. You know, when we when, when we mentioned this partnership and uh, 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 we're working with API three and we mentioned blockchains and Ethereum and so on, they go, oh, like this, the eyes light up, you know. Um, uh, um, and uh, so, you know, definitely, definitely the interest, um, you know, I would say like, uh, like the financial institutions that they are, that they won't be super fast to move, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're definitely interested. I mean, banks took a, a long while to get into uh, um, uh, open banking, you know. Uh, I mean, obviously, some, some moved faster uh, than, uh, than, than others, right? Um, uh, and some were dragged kicking and screaming uh, because, because of regulators, right? But some banks clearly, you know, they're large part of their um, uh, uh, business is all around uh, providing services uh, over APIs, right? So we add the, when we add the, the blockchain into this mix and all the, the different efficiencies and, uh, um, yeah, and you know, all the different attributes you get from blockchains, I think that's a really, really interesting um, 
mix of technologies and capabilities that's gonna gonna like bring just lo lots of products which are um, uh, not 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 possible to do now because they're just not efficient. You know, when you when you add blockchains to to uh, a APIs, you have lots lots of lots of possibilities. I think. Hope answers the question. Yeah, definitely. Francisco, uh, you're muted, Francisco. Uh, Francisco, sorry. you're muted. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm muted. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. So. Um, yeah, question for, for Hagee. Um, this is basically, you know, me being on the open banking space and, and knowing how banks are sensitive with financial data or not even banks, but how, how sensitive financial data is in itself. Um, and you being a veteran in the API blockchain space, uh, let me ask you, how does API 3 enable centralized sensitive banking data to be used uh, safely on decentralized blockchains? How do you ameliorate some risks like exposing personal data and other vulnerabilities that the public might perceive as we go forward? Right, yeah. Well, I think like th there's the distinction of, of do you First of all, in, in, in blockchains, do you build on a public blockchain or a permission blockchain? And then for a permission blockchain, the, the sort of the, the risks of data exposure could be smaller if it's if it's within a permissioned uh, network of nodes, nodes being sort of different banks and so on and so forth. Um, that could be permission to, to have access to that information. But then when you're talking about Ethereum mainnet, obviously all of the, the data is public to everyone. So you probably don't want your bank account balance on on ethereum mainnet but i mean i guess in the in the in the the, the, the sort of the the spirit of of open data and an open banking even that could potentially be a, an option for you if you wanted to you know prove your your wealth uh, in, in in some way to a DeFi application for example and it's your data so you could you you, you could do it but obviously i think overall you know, it, it comes down to kind of um, having a lot of that data off chain, but be accessible to a user on chain. I think like there, the question of identity become, becomes a, a pretty salient one. So like, how do you connect uh, uh, an on chain identity with an off chain function? And how do you do that in the context of oracles when oftentimes oracles are mainly being considered for very general data types like price reference data or the weather or sports scores or something like that. So, so how do you like actually point an Oracle request to a, a, a certain user and then have that do something with the data off chain? Um, I think that's an interesting question that I think we're gonna be exploring as well. Um, and then, yeah, so when it comes to the, the method of, of sort of transportation for the data transmission, I, I suppose, um, uh, the, the, the question around the oracles is that like, is the data being provided from the first party? Like is, is, is the oracle also the data provider or is it a se separate party? And this is like mainly relevant for the sort of permission to use cases where you have a network of, of organizations that, that have a shared ledger um, and, and then share permissioned information within that network. Um, then like using some sort of third party for the Oracle middleware part, which is required to connect an API to that network, it, that would be exposing that data to that third party. And that's usually not what you want. And the, the sort of the solutions that are generally suggested for something like that are uh, like trusted execution environments and so on. Um, but then like the air node is, is, is kind of um, uh, privacy oriented by design because it's operated by the data provider. So, so it's the same Node oper the node operator for the Oracle is the same as the, the, the API operator. So, so it's not exposing anyone uh, or ex it's not exposing the data to anyone outside of the, the permission network. And so, so it's, it's also um, GDPR compliant, for example, for, for these types of use cases. So um, yeah, I, I guess that's touching a little bit on, on, on many angles of the topic, but I uh, hope that's fine. As we, uh, if I could just chip in there, maybe. We can also, uh, you know, imagine APIs which return kind of binary answers, you know, like in, in open right. banking, there's this uh, kind of available funds uh, um, APIs. You can also imagine, you know, uh, uh, 
PIs return yes, no, basically to questions. And so, you know, you can always have like a sliding scale of information you pass to the part of the blockchain, I guess. Yeah, I think it's like very much a gradient. Um, but then even like on the on the further end of that gradient, something like a binary answer wouldn't even be acceptable. So then you'd have to be like doing everything off chain. So like if, for example, if yeah. the question was, do I have $100,000 on my bank account, uh, then even a binary answer to that question, if the question was exposed, would yield yeah. something of, of like a privacy and non-preserving uh, yeah. outcome. So, yeah. That makes that makes really great sense. And, you know, one of the questions I have for Raul is kind of taking that together. And so how Simon said that, you know, with open banking, there's some banks that were very much more forward thinking and moving forward. And maybe we, we, we can expect that with, with, with certain banks jumping onto the blockchain. And as Heike just stated, you know, there, this is a possibility that we can build these solutions that are compliant and that are compliant and preserve the privacy of, of, of users at the end of the day. And so Raul, you know, with your previous experience as a regulator and now as a fintech director at DAI, you know, give us a, please give us an overview of the Mexican regulations and how it, it works with open banking, open finance, and how that comes in together with, with the blockchain space, please. Uh, sure, Robert, and hello, everyone. Well, um, Mexico is a pioneer in terms of regulated fintech because it was the first country that issued a We have freezing oh, row. Yeah. Oh, you just froze for a second before a bit row. Oh, okay, <laughs> I, I, I froze. So, well, I was saying that um, uh, Mexico was a pioneer because it was the first country that issued a law that specifically addresses the risk that come when delivering financial services through innovative digital schemas. Uh, for example, in other countries, there are individual documents that regulate e-money activities regulatory sandbox, open finance, or cryptocurrencies transactions. But in Mexico, uh, the FinTech law aims to act as a consolidating document that is based upon principles like, for example, financial inclusion, which in Mexico is very important because we still have a high percentage of bank population here, and principles like fair competence and being technologically neutral. So I think that that basically settles the ground, for example, for open banking and open finance and, and blockchain, because um, for example, uh, open finance is actually regulated in the fintech law and it, is specific, it specifies that financial entities have the obligation to open up their APIs, but uh, for, sharing data, for, for sharing data purposes. So when we have this mix between blockchain and open finance, I think that we can uh, visualize like a lot of opportunities because I think that the opportunities do not only come from banks, but also from fintechs that take advantage of consuming and gathering this information. And also in thinking in ways like automating processes or uh, migrating processes from like legacy systems to blockchain uh, processes and systems. And then how can these uh, fintechs or financial institutions provide the services to, to customers in a more convenient and more cost-effective ways. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very interesting take from, from the regulatory perspective and putting all the pieces together here from what has been said about open banking and what has been said about uh, API 3 Airnode and data oracles along with the uh, regulatory um, perspective. I think um, we need to uh, start discussing about use cases. So before the use cases come to fruition, um, we will need to decide um, on which blockchain platform we will actually make this happen, you know, and considering adoption to be a very important factor. I would like to pass here to the audience just uh, some questions on which uh, they think would be the most interesting uh, blockchain platform uh, for them. Um, there's in the poll, I don't know if you can see it. Um, but going back to that, I would like to ask the panelists just some of their insights regarding what use cases do you expect to materialize out of these uh, efforts?
Yeah, that's this is a general Raul. question to everyone. Yeah, that's to Raul, Simon, Raul. Uh, and yeah, and you too, Heiki. Okay, I, I, I would take a, give a kind of humorous answer, if I may. Uh, so a while ago, I was uh, organizing a hackathon and uh, came up with this funny idea called love insurance, right? So what's love insurance? So love insurance is, you know, you're, you're with your partner, you get married or your girlfriend, and you want to uh, put some money away for a rainy day, you know? And uh, so, you, you know, you, you sign up with your friends, and, uh, you know, they are your witnesses, right? And if you split up with your partner, then, you know, you get, I don't know, a couple of hundred uh, dollars or whatever, or a bit more for some champagne and a holiday, right? You know, and here's a, you know, an interesting use case for, uh, for, um, uh, for this type of integration, right? Because the smart contract, you know, they, they, uh, Obviously, you have to have something that's going to trigger this uh, th th this event, right? So if you, if you separate or divorce, you know, but then bang, 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 it's all automatic, right? You know, the money can, uh, the smart contract could, uh, it takes input from other people, decision is made. And, um, you know, maybe if one of the one of the parties is really down on their luck, then they get a bit more, a bit, a bit of a, bigger payout, you know, and, uh, you know, so you can use open banking APIs there to check balances and something like that. And you could, uh, you, could you know, obviously you could send uh, ETH or so, but you could also make make a payment to, uh, you know, uh, as they call it, meet space bank account, right? You know, And I mean, this is a funny, funny idea, whatever, right? But I think when, you know, when, uh, when you get new technologies coming together, you get you get this kind of disruptive inno innovation, right? You get processes and products that are possible because of the efficiencies, you know, like they can they can run fast. And I think we'll see, you know, like a, a lot of that, in, uh, you know, in the insurance space uh, and, um, yeah, you know, so in the... In the open banking space, and 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 I guess you know another thing that uh, Heike touched on uh, briefly earlier, you know, bank are like really well. I mean, people still trust their banks, right? I mean, they might be slow and and so on in, in, in many cases, but they they have to be slow because you know they're guarding lots of money and all the rest of it, right? But people really trust them in terms of uh, identity, yeah, and you know they've got my passport. Uh, they've, uh, you know, they've, um, so, uh, so, yeah, so once you've done KYC with a bank, then, you know, that, that's, a, that's an important thing. So, you know, we shouldn't only think about banks uh, as repositories of transaction data. They're also repositories of identity information and a whole bunch of other data as well, right? Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's yeah, my... I, I think like that that's a good point. Like they are repositories and 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 they're sort of these walled gardens of information in many ways. And I think where um, that is highly valuable information or something that you would want to own as a consumer, uh, a blockchain could be uh, you know the platform to do that for. and and I, I think like the vision is that the that blockchain is going to be the answer to that whole question of, self-sovereign identities for example in in the in the question of identity you just have validators and those validators could be banks banks you know know you uh for example as, as a bit of personal background i come from finland and, and and basically all of the applications just use online banking verification for your identity but then that's still something that is owned by your personal bank um sort of this siloing that information and putting it on the blockchain, but just having it verified by these, these entities. I think that's a powerful, powerful use case for, for open banking data and, 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 and these sort of um, identity oracles, I, I suppose. Um, and then, because yeah, then we've got this, yeah. we got, sorry, Haki, just to yeah. draw the picture a bit, right. So uh, the, then we've got this, totally distributed uh, blockchains and so on uh, with all that good stuff, you know, immutability, uh, no single point of, of reach or failure and stuff. But then we've got these, you know, like these highly secure, big nodes, uh, you know, and could be many of them, right? I mean, this is one of the things that the that open banking has done, right? Uh, regulation has like, okay, so, you know, UK were off the mark with the whole of Europe right now. We've got 
we got Mexico, many current countries in Latin America, Australia, da 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 da, Canada. You know, um, you know, uh, it's it's brought the data up, right? Like it's it's, uh, it's brought the data to the nearer the surface. There's like all the banks have got these APIs now and uh or not all of them of course but many many more of them have got these banks and then with uh, with these air nodes and these uh kind of point sources we can feed some of this data uh into the blockchain so i think that's quite a kind of robust uh yeah robust kind of pattern in a way yeah and and, and once you do kind of achieve that on-chain sovereign identity there's a lot of stuff that you can do with it like we discussed um connecting on-chain actions to an off-chain um, function like you know sending money from a bank account that is generally something that you could do with an open banking api but for you to do that on chain that api off-chain needs to know that it's you actually requesting it so that that ident identity needs to be native on chain and so how do you then manage that is 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 through this sort of validation scheme um yeah and and then just Overall, I think that's just a very narrow sliver of, of what gets enabled um, by by open banking data on the blockchain. You, you can yeah, you, you you can truly say that the 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 imagination is the limit. Raul, did you yeah. want to say something? Yeah, cool. Yes, uh, thanks. I, mean, I was thinking also in a use case, which is actually, for example, one real world uh, example in Mexico. This very technique that is starting to make some piloting with, uh, for example, mortgage credits, and they... Ra, maybe turn off your video, maybe? I don't know if you've got network, network, network issues, I don't know. <clears throat> Francisco, do you know about this use case that uh, I was talking about, like mortgage mortgage credits or something? Yeah. Mm, no, I, uh, I haven't heard about I, it. I don't think back. so. Yeah, because it's very innovative. I, I think so. Uh, what the platform is doing is like uh, conducting all these uh, credit by verification processes with the ID and with also with all the documentation. But there is a point that th that this company needs to make these payments, these disbursements from the bank account to the beneficiary account. And uh, they are like dealing with this problem of getting on-chain information with off-chain information. So I think uh, this particular case of use fits very well what uh, you are doing with API tree and mirror node, because in the end, the company subtracts and consumes information from the financial entities and then processes uh, the information into their blockchain platform and for the for some part of the process, they need to rely on some payment APIs or some ID verification APIs. So they are resolving this issue. But I think that with this uh, technology or with this solution, it will be much easier and standardized than what they are doing now. No? So I think that, that this is something very uh, a, a very particular use case for for what we are talking about. No. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> Absolutely, and it seems like it, it already has some traction. So, uh, for sure, we would like to to invite them to to our tech sprints and see what else can they add on top of what they're doing with using API three technology and OBP APIs at its core. But I think right now we're moving on to the next stage of the questions, and uh, Robert will be taking over now with some questions. Yeah, sure. So one of the questions that we have is especially now with the with with what happened last year with coronavirus it really showed a lot of flaws within the financial system and so for example governments are exploring cbdc's uh, central bank uh, digital currencies and so one of the things that, are, that they're exploring is you know um a, a step away from these uh, from cash to actual digital from digital money and so blockchains are often brought up in in these discussions and so one of the questions is, well, how can API 3 and the Open Bank Project serve as a hub for governments to look at when exploring CBDCs and see this partnership as, as a hub for blockchain-based adoptions? And what can API 3 and Open Bank Project do to, um, to help in, 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 the, in that mission, in that discovery mission? 
So should I maybe take that? I guess, is this is this again like to all? Yes, all yes, okay. to all participants. Yeah, sure, Simon, go ahead. I, I can follow up. Okay, well, I guess first thing is, you know, what we do for banks and regulators uh, on this topic is like to to make the whole topic a little bit less scary, right? You know, so when I'm when I'm uh, like teaching uh, or yeah, educating or communicating about APIs and so on to to regulators and uh, and banks back in the earlier days, you know, I would always like draw uh, comparisons between warehouses and URLs and uh, uh, making rest calls and stuff like that, you know, just to, just to kind of bring down to, you know, so it's not, 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 uh, not quite as uh, scary and so on. And I think we could do similar thing with, uh, with, with, with the whole blockchain space, right? I mean, there's obviously lots of concepts uh, and uh, terminology and technology that needs to be kind of explained. And I think this really, uh, really comes to life. So our experience of organizing many, many hackathons over the years, you know, starting back, I think the first one was 2013 in London uh, uh, at the FinTech Innovation Lab. Uh, you know, um, like uh, banks and individuals at banks and departments at banks, they really respond well to seeing use cases and live apps being, you know, built quickly, developed and, and working, right? And so I, I think this is one of the things that we can do. And, you know, on a kind of sort of going forward uh, uh, perspective, you know, when uh, these uh, central bank coins uh, come in, you know, uh, you know, as uh, as they will, you know, th these coins will want to be in all, in everyone's apps as well, right? So just like I, I, I can see, you know, my various bank accounts on my my app or one uh, bank account in my my. Uh, 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 desktop device, right? I, I want to see uh, my balances in, in, in various currencies there as well. So it will just make, you know, so REST APIs and the apps which consume them are not going away, you know, any, any super time soon, right? But, but, but we'll want to interact with the blockchain. It's just, it'll be just like plugging into a new, a new source of power or plugging into, I've got a synthesizer over here. So, you know, plugging into a new synthesizer, right? You can get some different sounds out of the synthesizer. You can get some different features and functionality. And, and let's face it, there's lots of wealth going into the whole blockchain. There's lots of wealth in blockchains right now, right? And it just totally makes sense for these, uh, yeah, these, uh, assets to move more freely between uh, between the two or at least the information about them to move uh, more freely hey simon yeah. uh, thanks for that uh, i would like to take it a, a step backward and just give maybe a little bit bird's eye view on my thoughts uh, from being an economist on what are the implications of this and uh, what are some risk of the cbdc's and when you think about it in terms of monetary policy when when a central bank uh, directly um, issues currencies to the consumers, then uh, the consumers, uh, I mean, the banks are at a direct risk of um, losing the way they do money because usually the central bank issues money, they give a discount rate, the bank gets the money at a discount rate, which the bank then gives to the consumers. So if the central banks were to issue digital money to the consumers, it would be a direct threat to monetary policy as we know it. So I think here the challenge is, okay, how will banks integrate these CBDCs and pass it to the consumers so they can do payments on their daily lives? And I think here, whether it comes of a private blockchain or a public blockchain, uh, with our partnership with API3, we'll be prepared to put those rails, those infrastructures for CBDCs to come onto the banking industry and be um, deployed onto a mobile payments app so it will not uh, cut out the banks. So that's just some, some of my ideas on, on how will this move forward. And, and, and another big challenge is um, just a personal background here on, on, on my end is that I'm from El Salvador and I was coming here Last Friday, and I just uh, landed to the news that El Salvador accepts Bitcoin as legal tender, first country in the world to do that. So a uh, few, few days later, I, I get contacted and I'm in a meeting with the Ministry of Finance 
and they're all worried because they have no idea what this means, you know? And, and then I told them like, look, first relax because for a, a legal, uh, for a cryptocurrency to be considered as legal tender and entered uh, an economy, first you need to solve the identity issue. How do you link that Bitcoin to a real identity? And this again is one of the proof points that we're exploring in this partnership. But if any of you guys, Raul, Heiki, have some other thoughts about this, I'm really happy to hear. Yeah, I, I think from a from a you know overall perspective, this has the uh, potential to be a similar situation for the banks as open banking was initially. It, it can be seen as both a, a disintermediation threat or a, a, a big opportunity to uh, to kind of expand on their services and. And uh, yeah. and also create more connectivity between between consumers and 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 fintechs and 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 and, and blockchain based applications. And I think uh, overall CBDCs have the the opportunity to really kind of push DeFi to the mainstream in the sense that it, it sort of forces um, digital currencies on 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 consumers in the sense that if you have digital dollars that are compatible with with blockchain based platforms that that ex that exist on these platforms then if if um if, if those platforms are anything like the platforms of today where you know you can build any sort of deterministic application on ethereum and then just have that and then it does something useful with uh in the in the financial space then then essentially you holding digital currency makes makes your you know financial uh, self very compatible with that that new ecosystem of decentralized applications and and as this kind of like grows and, and gains adoption I think it just means that we have a lot more people um, with access to DeFi and, and and decentralized applications in in general um, and and then that means that there's also more demand for different types of applications beyond just the the stuff that we currently see in DeFi which is mostly about borrowing lending um, leverage positions on on cryptocurrencies um, and, and 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 things like this, like it, it, it creates more demand for something like the current fintech space, which is already connected to the real world and uh, and has um, uh, the ability to connect to APIs and and stack APIs on top of each other to create all kinds of useful applications. So I think with this added demand, and there's going to be um, uh, sort of added supply on the on the application side, and then when you connect um, real world data and 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 and, and, and banking data and, and and banking functionalities and 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 all kinds of API delivered services to this Web three space, I think it, it, it's going to look essentially nothing like it does at the moment. So um, yeah, it's exciting times. Raúl. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Hickey and Simon. Uh, we'll turn on not my video. I think that, uh, for example, regarding the CDBCs, there is an issue, as Francisco was saying, with monetary policy, because, for example, here in, in Mexico, one of the worries uh, about the central bank is that uh, they could lose the control, no? for example, about issuing uh, the, the coins or about controlling the, the, the monetary policy. So uh, we have had some interesting discussions with uh, officers from the central bank and they recognize that in the end, Mexico will have some CDBC at, at some time. However, uh, they haven't specified about a timeline or they haven't uh, comment on specific agreements. So I think that they are, just, they are just looking at what is the impact or the outcome of having a CDBC. However, for example, in Mexico, I think that there are some uh, important efforts about uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, we have just had uh, the announcement of uh, Mexican stablecoin, which is called PEXO. It's, it's spelled P-X-O, no? And this, this PEXO stablecoin seems to uh, have some leverage and impact within the uh, remittances business. In Mexico, remittances is the one of the most important sources of income for the country, along with the tourism and, and along with the uh, oil sales or oil business. So um, this specs stable coin will be used for, for remittance uh, transmission, transmission. So I think that while the regulators and the central banks are still like having the discussion about how this CDBC could be used or could be issued or could be managed, I think that in the meantime for the industry side, uh, projects like this, stable, like this Mexican stable coin 
are very important so that they can show the, the importance of uh, having these digital currencies. No? That's a phenomenal. That's 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 a phenomenal insight, Raul, and 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 that's that really leads open the door to so many more innovations and opportunities. And now, since we're running up against time, we'd like to open up the the, um, the floor for any Q and A. Uh, Francisco, you may have access to the chat. Um, yeah, I have some uh, some one question actually, and basically is if it, it will run on Cardano, if this will work on Cardano, if we, if we will develop something on Cardano? I guess I can, I can answer that from um, API3 side. So yeah, I, I, like we're building everything that we're building to be very blockchain agnostic. So, um, so that means that you know, even UTXO based uh, uh, chains like Cardano would be covered by uh, by the air node. At the same time, like we do, do um, have this sort of priority of 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 trying to serve as many of the existing use cases as possible. So uh, at the moment, I, I think we have a pretty strong Ethereum focus, and uh, and that ob obviously also uh, entails the EVM compatible chains because uh, from an integration perspective, that's uh, a, a short step away. Um, but yeah, so overall, uh, Cardano is 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 an interesting platform uh, for for smart contract developer development and and our space as a whole. So um, so yeah, like it, it very much falls within our our scope of of remaining as as blockchain agnostic as possible. Thank you, Heiki. We have another question here from Dennis Scott. And that is, are there any pilot studies where banks are offering DeFi services for enterprise? I think you guys are probably, um, um, Simon, maybe Raul, if, if you've heard of this stuff, Francisco. Personally, personally no. And I think that question reflects that he really has the vision of what we're trying to do because to offer DeFi for enterprise, it requires this whole uh, open banking component with an air node and to make accessible uh, uh, DeFi product onto uh, the banking uh, experience or the banking industry. And this is precisely what we're trying to build on. Perhaps making yep. a specific uh, banking asset class, the new source of collateral to provide DeFi to banking users. And very good question. Thanks thanks for that. I don't know if anyone wants yeah. to expand on that. Yeah, I mean, just, oh, yeah, I mean, you said it, uh, Francisco, this is what we, we want to do, right? And we want to bring some banks into some of the tech spins, uh, you know, and invite them in and uh, yeah, show them the art of the possible. Yeah, maybe like as a as an idea, like the, just even connecting the existing DeFi ecosystem to to um, to bank services that they can offer to some of their customers. I think that's also a regulatory uh, perspective there um, in terms of like uh, you, you know is this is this something that banks could do like basically offer um, kind of defy um, stable returns on 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 um, on a person's funds for example um, I think that's a that's an interesting question so so banks certainly like play a, a role on on both sides or have the ability to play a role on both sides thanks Heiki. Uh, so I think for now uh, we don't have any more questions um, a question was asked and it seems the, the feedback here of, of the community would like to see these developments be done on Ethereum, uh, Ethereum 2.0. Um, yeah, so that's great because it's in alignment of uh, what we think would cause uh, more adoption. We also have a, a quorum as a significant contender, which makes sense because it's uh, the banking industry. And then we have also Cardano um, there. On, and then for last, we have 
Polygon and Polkadot. We do also have a question in the Q&A um, from Alan White. If you click on Q&A. Q&A, yeah. Is anyone familiar with a data sharing D app project for open banking? At the moment, no, we're not aware of any. I don't know if any of you guys here is aware. I think this is what we're really working towards. And these text prints are really going for the focus and to really build out these different, allow the opportunity, allow for a hub to happen for different developers and different community members to come come aboard and build these dApps to see what can be, be done. And for example, what the panel just presented with CBDCs as being a possible uh, experimentation process just to get the scariness, as Simon mentioned, out of the way, that could be a part, part of these discussions. And, you know, um, part of this, I, I want to ask if we don't have any more Q&As, I want to, if there is, please stop me, but if there isn't, um, I'd like to ask Raul, you know, what can we do as for, to make com as, as compliant friendly and regulatory friendly applications built on the, on the blockchain, uh, pass regulatory mustard, pass these regulatory uh, scrutiny um, within your experience? Uh, thanks, Robert. Yes, well, actually, for example, in the case of Mexico, uh, the regulator is very open to uh, innovation. So actually, when talking about compliance, uh, what the regulator worries about is, for example, the, the security of the information, you know, that the information is stored in a reliable manner that is available. You know? uh, for example, that you have in place all the, uh, ma the, the controls and, and measures so that if you receive an attack, you, you can deal with that attack. And fortunately, you, you don't have any breach. So that's mainly what the regulator is worried about. Uh, they, they're not that worried about the technology that is in the backside. No? For example, it can be blockchain, it can be another technology. So uh, actually, uh, from the business side, there are some institutions that are developing some uh, open finance APIs no? that do not fall under the regulatory APIs. And they see these banks, they see, uh, they see it as an opportunity to develop a business or a revenue no? uh, coming from these APIs. And some of them are very really looking forward and they are exploring uh, technologies like blockchain, like to merge these processes. Now I, I spoke about this uh, case of use regarding this company that is uh, offering uh, like this credit product using blockchain and, and APIs and they are now merging into one single platform. So uh, since this is a pilot no, that the regulator is or, or will, will authorize anytime soon, I think that more of these examples we will see it in the in the near future. So, uh, while you have uh, managed the, the the information security controls, I think that you are on the other side, and also that you can justify and show the regulators how you are doing it. No? Thank you, Raul. So, sorry no, for no. cutting it short here. Uh, I would like to make a clarification to Alan McDonald that they say that uh, there's a DApp project for open banking. And even though it has some similar connotations, it has a complete different objective of what we're trying to do here. Um, they do sell data to marketplaces. We don't even know uh, if that's GDPR compliant, but in this whole um, vision, we're, being, we're bringing the, we're, we have three points. We have the open banking project feeding direct banking data via the air node to the blockchain platform so developers can build uh, and use open banking APIs to create new uh, type of solution for the next generation of financial services, which brings uh, open banking um, and a blockchain technology at its core. So, but uh, thank you. I think, I think it's a good um, it's a good point that you brought up, but it's totally different from the vision and mission of what we're doing here. And we definitely want to respect everyone's time for joining us today, from the audience to the panel and the, e the folks at EEA. So we want to say a big thank you. I think um, we should wrap up here. And a big thank you to the audience, a big thank you to EEA and the panelists, of course. Um, any Last last minute thoughts as we before we sign off. 
No, Come I to the it... tech sprints, right? Come to the tech sprints. Yes. <laughs> that right. Yeah. <laughs> and Come I think tech sprints. We, we ought to pass it back to Brittany for some closing remarks on behalf of EEA. Thank you, Francisco. And thank you for everyone else for joining us as well. It was great. Um, please feel free to place your social media handles in the chat so all attendees can follow your work. Um, for additional information about joining the EEA, please reach out to membership at ENTETHalliance.org or visit us on our website at HTTPS ENTEalliance.org slash join. Or you can also follow the EEA on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Um, thank you. This concludes today's EEA Education Series webinar. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye. Take care.